because it is 5.30. Okay. Then if it is 5.30, I think we should begin. So welcome everyone to the Airport Master Plan Advisory Committee. Um, first order of business is call to order and then uh, roll call, I would assume. Yeah, why don't I do that quickly? Um, it's just easier to call everyone's name. Uh, Bob Bartholomew. Are you here? Robert is here. Dan Drazen. Here. Ray. Bay. Ray. I will look for him in a moment. Um, Mike Frank is said he was here. Here. Jade Hofeld. Here. Julie Luffler. Julie. I'll look for her in a moment here. Rich, uh, Rich Morey is here. Kevin Munson's here. Deanna Porter. Here. Uh, Cynthia Richson. Cynthia Richson. Are you present? Okay, I will check for her in a moment. She is. Show, I I think I know her phone number. Can and, you I actually, Mar Mark? Can you hear me yeah. now? Now I hear you. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. And actually, this is a good reminder. Um, we've had this with. A, I found this before too. If you are on a phone, um, try pressing star six one. Is it? I think. If you if you are unable to be heard. I will try and keep an eye on hands and, and things like that. Uh, if, but for some reason, a few people have difficulty connecting with their audio, even if I authorize them to, you know, un to unmute them. Uh, so I think it's star six one. I think it's just star six, Mark. Star six? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, John Schaefer, are you present? I'm here. And Mark Warshower, are you present? I'm here. So I'll go back to Ray Fay. Are you present? I'm here. I'm Is here. that a yes? I'm Ray Fay is here. Oh, thank you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to change your name here so that we know it's you. And then uh, Julie, are you present? Julie Leffler. Okay, so we have 12 members present. The only one missing is Julie, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, so the next order here is uh, approval of the minutes. Hopefully everyone has had a chance to review the meeting minutes of September 24th, 2020. Um, Mr. Chair, can I make a, a quick request, please? Uh, Julie, if you are present and are still, obviously we're not hearing you if you are, um, please call my office number and I will help you. Uh, my number is 821-8394. All right, go ahead, uh, Robert. Sorry to interrupt. No, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so uh, the meeting minutes are out there. Um, this is kind of not the right order, but uh, well, the right order is, do I hear a motion to approve the meeting minutes? Actually, I'd like to make uh, amendments, if I may. Uh, that's 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 why I, I knew that would probably happen and, and I think the correct order is usually to uh, make motions and then and then ask for comments and changes but why don't we just take it out of order and hear your uh, let's do it correctly I make a motion to accept the minutes as submitted okay do I hear a second this or is my second oh, there's a lot of voices there uh, mark do you did you get one for a second uh, well Mike Frank's picture came up so he must have been the one that was the loudest so. okay so we have a motion and a second now are there any comments or changes or things that should be looked at for uh, the meeting minutes Cynthia you have the floor yes. thank you Robert so um, my only comment is on item three pre presentation and discussion uh, there were questions and then there were answers and only the questions are reflected which is really half of a record and like kind of the more meaningless half um, so I think that we should have at least some type of one sentence or two sentence general reply by Mead and Hunt. Otherwise, you're leaving out the most important part. Mr. Chair, I can comment if you'd like. I would welcome that. Thank you. So I've been encouraged for some time now in my career to simply record the motions that happen at meetings. 
Obviously, I have set a precedent, a high quality of, of minute taking over the years, not just with this committee, but with others. Um, we now have Zoom recordings through, through uh, because of COVID. And so what I have offered as a service is the placement of the recording, the minutes at the top with the link embedded in the minutes. And I feel that this approach is um, much easier to, instead of having a debate about the properly phrasing what is said, I captured for some for posterity, for, for record keeping, the questions that were asked. If there's people who wish to know the responses, they've got the recording to go to for the un, unfiltered response. That is my approach. If you wish for me to change that, I will happily do what the what the committee wishes. I stand so may I go ahead. I stand in support of Mark because every committee I've been on for 20 years and Robert rules, you do not record discussion, you record the topic, you record motions and responses to the motions. And that this idea of putting the whole discussion in the minutes is not part of my understanding of formal minutes. And I think Mark has done it correctly. So I'm gonna respectfully disagree. Uh, this is half of what was there. So uh, I understand the desire for brevity, but this is a permanent, municipalities are required to keep minutes in perpetuity. And someday the recording, either technology is going to change or it's not going to be on the website anymore for people to readily take a couple hours out of their life and listen to it. Uh, so I think it's misleading to just act like it was only questions because there were answers. So uh, I really think that if you're going to have the questions there, you should at least have a one sentence answer. So it's clear that it was a Q and an A, Q and an A. Okay, I, it's uh, Mark Warshower. I'd suggest <clears throat> that you know John, if this sets a precedent for all city meetings that are handled one way, and then you have this this advisory voluntary advisory committee doing it a complete other way, where we can actually go out and see the answers, you know, I I don't don't think that we need to go overboard on the recording. That's my two cents. Okay. Oh, I will also take this moment to say I've had a couple requests, one from Chair Richardson, as well as from a Middleton resident, a city Middleton resident, uh, Fred Klansnick, to have their comments that they've made at previous meetings or letters that we receive be recorded in conjunction as part of the minutes. And that is something I discussed with the city administrator, and he advised that that is not um, a standard, that that is not something that we will do. Uh, we can't just have people providing comments other than outside of a public hearing. A public hearing we treat differently. Uh, but if somebody has comments and just wants to have comments added to any meeting, and then in the case of Mr. Klansnick wasn't present, it, it just sets a, it just seems to me to set a standard that is um, not, uh, it's, a, it's an undesirable precedent. So Mark, can I just ask you, because that's totally inconsistent with what the administrator has previously himself requested. For example, on August 20 of 2020, he specifically asked for a statement given by another at a meeting, and then it was in the minutes, and then I guess he decided to take it out of the minutes, and then I don't know where it wound up. But that's not a consistent approach. I, I'm sorry, I don't know what August, ref oh, you're talking about the, the a joint the meeting? Joint the joint meeting between the towns and the city. I mean, Mr. Davis asked for my opening remarks. They were in and then they came out. And I don't know, Mr. Burke, you may have some insights on that that I don't. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's nice to say one thing, but the consistent behavior is probably a better indicator. And I can speak to at least that one topic, which is not relevant to this, that I know the your submitted comments were part of that record. Um, so let's figure out what we want to do here as a committee. Uh, the next hand I see up is Julie. Julie, can you unmute yourself and take the floor? Let me see if I can find her hand. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, there yes. we go. Sorry about that. I've been having a few computer issues. Um, so the question I want to ask with respect to this is, and, and excuse me if I missed this discussion because I was a couple minutes signing in because I was having some computer trouble. What happens to the recorded 
meeting after the minutes are accepted and approved by this committee? The recording is um, available on our website, on YouTube. I have it included in the minutes at the top of the meeting. I'm the only person who does that for all city meetings. And it's available I, in YouTube searchable on our website, yeah. our website. What I meant, Mark, is how long are those held by the city of Middleton? I mean, I guess it's on YouTube indefinitely since you put it on YouTube, correct? Our intent, I can't speak to if the city ever decides to remove them, but I would hope not. Once they, once they okay. exist, they're a record. They, they Thank are there. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. That's a, so and I, you know, a year or two years ago, we didn't have recordings. Uh, well, this is only the last nine months or so. We had the video recordings of plan commission and council meetings only. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, the next name I see on here is uh, Rich Mori. Okay, yeah, I don't see a reason to reinvent the wheel if this is uh, not standard if, uh, to record answers. I don't see any reason we need to do so. We have a recording, we can go in. There is no uh, difference of opinion as to what one word was or was said. I, I think this is a much cleaner uh, system. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none. Um, Julie, is is did your hand just go up again? Do, do you do you have a, a second comment? Well, I do. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I just wondered why the I, I'm sure Mark, you already explained this, but why in the past have you gone into the answers and decided this time not to go into the answers? I guess that's the question that I have in my mind because the, the minutes were a lot more thorough previous to this to this meeting. And that is my question. And I do beg your pardon if you've already covered it. Sure. Um, it is workload and it is, um, uh, aside from workload, it is, I have everything captured that was discussed at the last meeting in the form of these questions. And it indicates at the top that the project staff responded to those questions and, the, and there's a link to the recording. Um, so it, aside from workload, it's really the fact that I've documented all the questions that were asked. And um, for clarity, people can consult the recording themselves if they wish to know the exact answer. This is Bob Bartholomew. I just have a question. I'm not that familiar with meeting proceedings. Uh, I've tried escape meetings since my faculty days. Uh, but do the Roberts Rules of Orders offer any guidance on this? I, I would say that uh, Roberts Rules of Order are very long and very cumbersome and people try to abide by them. If we were to follow Robert's rules uh, exactly, I'm not sure what they would say, except that I think this is, this is, this is more of a, a policy decision. Um, if somebody else wants to correct me on that, I, I don't know that Robert's rules, they tell how to run a meeting. I don't know that they, uh, preclude what can or cannot be in uh, meeting minutes. All right. Thank you. Robert, so, would you like a little help on that? I would welcome a comment. <laughs> um, sure. So you're right. Robert's rules, it is more of what the body wants. Uh, it should be consistent, though. And actually, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities has a very good article on this, which you guys, I'm sure, are a member of. Uh, it's a matter of, uh, you know, it's for future reference. If you need that information, because you know technology changes, those tapes will not be out there forever. The cost of storing it might be, you know, go really high. So it's really some do it. They don't. It's not a transcript, right? It's not a public hearing. It's not a transcript like in court. Uh, it shouldn't be so bare bones that it's meaningless. So it's some sort of a balance that the body decides upon. Thank I you, Cynthia. Yeah, I'm really disturbed by this whole conversation because the motion is to approve the minutes. The minutes are a record 
of the items that and discussed and there's absolutely all, all the things you want to add are not res, they're, they're not refuting what's in these minutes and i'm kind of tired of spending half hour or two hours going back and forth on basically the rules that have been followed that the minutes do reflect the topics that were introduced the things we talked about if you want a total perfect absolute record of everything Who's to say that the paper minutes are going to last forever? Fire could come, burn down the building. This idea of longevity seems to me a real straw man, and I don't know why we're dragging this on forever, and I'm kind of tired of it. I have a motion. I would hope, Robert, that you would act on a motion. Mr. Schaefer, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. The municipality has a legal obligation to keep accurate minutes into perpetuity. That is statutory, and these are questions only. There's no answers there, and this is not a superfluous discussion. I'm going to respectfully disagree with you. That, that's fine. You're welcome to your position. Thank you. Okay, the next hand I see up is uh, Rich Mori. Yes, is it uh, in order to, to second uh, John's motion and move for a vote to accept these minutes? I, we already have a first and a second. Um, okay. So I, I, I thank How about you for the motion to limit discussion. Let me just ask. I don't like to be presumptuous in 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 limiting discussion. I think we've kind of come to we've heard the the various viewpoints. I will ask: Is there anybody else who wants to speak before we move forward with uh, a vote? Thank you. Hearing none. Uh, the current motion is to approve the meeting minutes as written. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Rich son, they're incomplete. I'd like the rationale of why I'm voting no in the record, please. I think that can be accommodated. Thank you. So Richson voted against because she considers the minutes to be incomplete. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, now that, um, that was the meeting minutes. Uh, the next item is under discussion action items. Number one, presentation and discussion of chapter three facility requirements. Um, I would, I believe we might have one or two members of Mead and Hunt available. Um, and I would invite them at this time to, uh, introduce themselves and, 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 and start their presentation. Thank you. Um, Robert, can you hear me all right? I can hear you great. Thanks, Greg. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, Mark, I think what we were hoping to do is um, just give a very brief overview through a PowerPoint. And um, I guess if I could share a screen. Um, I, I stopped sharing so that you could. Okay. Uh, you can take um, the screen. Do I need to? Here, let me see what I need to do. I thought you, we just, I thought you were able to just take it last time. Yeah, uh, let me let me try this and hopefully it'll show up here. There you go. Is that coming through all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I'm gonna try to make this so it shows up full screen. And just bear with me one second here. What I'd like to do is not be able to see myself here. <laughs> so I'm just trying to move uh, this out of the way here. So um, I minimize there. So now is it, I'm hoping everyone has just seen the PowerPoint and, and not uh, any video or anything like that. Is that? Um, yep, that's correct. Is that? Okay, great. Well, um, thank you. And um, I appreciate everyone's time and, and, and joining us here. This is our fifth meeting uh, for the advisory committee. Uh, our agenda here uh, for what this presentation is. Uh, again, I want to keep this very uh, high level summary of the chapter and, and really you know, have more time for, for discussion and questions on it. Um, so I will go through the chapter in, in, uh, in uh, pretty high level. Uh, want to introduce our team. Uh, I want to talk about some of the capacity questions that were brought up uh, at last meeting. Uh, bring a, a reminder of the design standards that are, are applicable um, to, to Middleton. And then talk about uh, the airfield. 
um, the runways, the taxiways, the aprons, um, talk about the nav aids, the approaches and the airspace. Uh, we know that uh, aircraft storage is a, um, uh, there's some significant demand for, for additional storage. We wanna talk about that. And then lastly, we'll touch on the terminal, the FBO and support facilities. And, and with that, uh, I then try to turn it back to you, Robert, and, and the AMPAC for, for a discussion. Um, then we can talk about you know, where we go after this chapter, our next steps, the schedule. And then uh, I think we wanted to try to have an opportunity for the, for the public to make some comments um, uh, as well. So uh, just real quickly introducing our team, uh, myself, Greg Stern, uh, Rick Dunkelberg, and Barbara Michael uh, are from Mead and Hunt. Um, I'll kind of lead the, the, the presentation, the discussion from side to side. Um, Rick and Barbara um, will kind of help with facilitating discussion, answering questions. Uh, and I'm hoping that we also have Josh Holbrook from the Bureau of Aeronautics out there. Um, Josh, do we got you? Um, and and if, if we do, hopefully Josh can kind of help uh, jump in uh, when we get into the discussion as well. So. Josh is on the call. Uh, yes, right. okay, great, thank you. Uh, so real quick, um, you know, the role of facility requirements uh, in this process, you know, the intent is to analyze the existing facilities on the airport against what the current FAA standards are, uh, as well as to assess, you know, how those existing facilities meet both existing demand and, and future demand over the 20 year planning horizon. The other, the other part of the, the facility requirements are really to form the basis for how we develop alternatives, uh, which will be our, our next chapter. Um, First thing I wanted to touch on was, was airfield capacity. And, and I know this was brought up at our, at our last meeting. Um, airfield capacity is uh, determined or it's based on a metric um, that's called the annual service volume. <laughs> and annual service volume is uh, very simply the, the number of operations that, that an airport can handle, handle on an annual basis. Uh, and there's a number of things that, that play into uh, that, that number. Uh, some factors that include, you know, weather conditions, uh, how many runways are at an airport, um, does, do the runways have parallel taxiways, and, and how many exit taxiways, um, what is the, the fleet of the aircraft, um, peaking characteristics, and then um, maybe one of the most important things that applies to Middleton here is the, the number of touch and go operations um, that occur at the airport. Um, when we look at the touch and go operations at Middleton, we started this um, calculation with a very conservative estimate of 15% of, of the operations being touch and goes. And with that assumption, the annual service volume for Middleton is 165,000 operations a year. And so when you compare that with the number of operations that occurred last year, um, roughly 41,000, and compare it to how many operations are projected over the 20 year horizon, even, even on the high end of those, those growth projections, um, looking at 50,000. When you compare the operations at Middleton in terms of its capacity, it's roughly you know, 25 to 30% of, of the capacity of that air service volume. Now we know that uh, touch and go operations are actually probably higher than 15%, but as you assume a higher uh, percentage of touch and go operations, the, the capacity actually increases. And the reason for that is, you know, when planes are doing touch and goes, they're not landing, you know, they're, they're coming, they're, they're touching and then accelerating and leaving. So assuming a 50% of the operations at Middleton are touch and goes, uh, the service volume actually goes to 208,000 operations a year. So the, the upshot of, of these calculations are that, looking at the number of operations at Middleton, 40,000 projecting to 50,000 over the 20 year horizon, capacity is, is really not a, a concern for this airport. We're not looking at adding runways or, or other facilities like that. Well, no, there may be some more questions on this, but this is just a very, again, very big brush and we can circle back to this later. Um, the next item I wanted to touch on, uh, if I could advance, is, is the design standards um, that apply to, to Middleton. So when we presented the, the forecast um, at our last meeting, we talked about the B-2 aircraft being the, the design critical aircraft for, for the airport. Uh, much of the airfield is, is already constructed to B-2 standards, um, things such as the, 
the, the width of the runway and the separation of the runway between um, the taxiway and the runway safety area standards. Um, the B-2 aircraft, again, are those with approach speeds between 91 and 121 knots and wingspans between 49 and 78 feet. Um, one important thing to note is that, you know, one aircraft does not have to meet both of those design criteria. So there, there might be several aircraft that are in the B grouping, um, but that are not group two, and there, and there may be some that are in the group two that are, are not B. Um, but if you're having a combination that equates to more than 500 B and more than 502, um, you're in that, that family grouping of B2 aircraft. Um, again, not all the airfield needs to meet B2 standards, only those areas that are intended to support regular operations by those aircraft. And, and for Middleton, we're talking about, you know, the primary runway, the primary taxiway, access to the terminal and the apron, access to the fuel farms, and, and access to the hangars that are accommodating aircraft of that size. So as we're evaluating facilities and, and, and we're, we're looking at, you know, those are our standards that we're looking at. Um, so right now I wanna get into the, the runways, the taxiways and the aprons. Um, and this is just a, a quick screenshot of, of the airfield. Uh, again, the, the primary runway, runway 1028 is, is 4,000 feet long. It's hundred feet wide. There is a, a crosswind uh, that's a turf crosswind, uh, 1,800 feet long, and it's maintained to 120 feet wide. And that, and that 120 foot width is the, the width of the, the runway and its safety area and how it's mowed and graded. Off the ends of the runway are these trapezoidal yellow areas, which are referred to as the runway protection zones or RPZs. And when you look at either end of runway 1028, both of those RPZs are, are pretty well contained on airport property. Uh, there's a small portion of the runway 10 that, that encroaches off airport property. And, and I should note that the airport property is the red line on this drawing. Um, but that portion that, that it runs off airport property is, is within an navigation easement that helps control the, the land uses in that area. When we look at the turf runway, the, the RPZs that extend um, off the both the north and south ends of that, both of those extend off airport property by pretty significant amounts. Uh, when we look at the north side, that RPZ, uh, what extends off airport property is pretty well contained within what's called a clear zone easement. Now, a clear zone easement is a little bit more restrictive than an navigation easement in that its controls are all the way to the ground. So it, it really restricts any sort of building. Uh, but within that area, you know, farming operations and things that are generally um, compatible are, are, are pretty well, it's limited to those kind of operations. One of the biggest things we see is on the south end, you know, the, the runway one RPZ extends into airport road, uh, a very busy road, um, and into commercial lots south of airport road, some that are developed and, and some that are not. So as we're looking at the, the airport's configuration, the, the configuration of the runways, some of the things we see as opportunities for improvement are, um, again, the, the RPZ for runway one, uh, but the other thing is the intersection of, of these two runways, how they intersect. Uh, now, having runways intersect isn't by itself a, a safety issue. Um, you, you see that quite often. But if you look at current FAA standards, there is a, a desire where possible to try to decouple runways, to try to um, eliminate their safety areas from overlapping. So when we look at this intersection and we look at the runway one RPZ, to the extent we could shift that further north, um, decouple the runways, separate them, and pull that RPZ onto the airport property, uh, those are things that we think should be looked at as we, as we move into the alternatives. Um, one of the other things in regard to the, the airport's configuration is uh, this turf operations area. So that there are operations that are occurring in the grass area beside the paved area within the, the safety areas of the runway. Um, the city is, is aware of this, uh, you know, their insurance has, has, has covered that. Um, and the FAA's guidance on that is, is evolving. Um, one of the latest, latest versions of the, the design AC for airports is, is still in draft phase, but it, it's, it's got a new section that's titled um, diverse aeronautical uses on an airport. Um, and so there is some um, awareness being brought to this. And, and I guess our recommendation is that the city and the airport 
work with the Bureau, work with FAA flight standards um, on, on whether that you know, is the best location for that um, and, and something to consider um, uh, going into to future actions. Um, so with that discussion on the, the, the airfield's configuration, I now wanna talk about um, length requirements, runway length requirements, and, and starting with the, the primary length requirements. Um, guidance on runway length requirements, it comes from, from the FAA. They have an advisory circular, 150, 50 through 25B. And the big thing I want to mention about guidance on runway length is that it's based on aircraft weight. So, you know, in, in the forecast and in other sections, we've talked about the B2 being the size of the aircraft, both wingspan and um, and that sets a lot of um, criteria for, for separation and widths and, and, and things of that. But when we're talking about runway length, um, that is based on aircraft weight, the maximum takeoff weight. And when we look at the aircraft at Middleton, uh, there's really four weight categories that apply. And, and that critical threshold um, uh, in how you, how you approach runway length the calculations occurs at a weight of 12,500 pounds for maximum takeoff weight. For aircraft that are heavier than 12,500 pounds, there's a, a certain chapter of the advisory circular that applies and the certain tables and guidance. And, and for aircraft that are under 12,500, there's a, a separate chapter and section that applies. For each of those, um, there's a similar five-step process where you're identifying your critical aircraft, um, you're selecting the appropriate um, charts and, and tables, and um, selecting a runway length that corresponds, and then making necessary adjustments. And when we do that for, for Middleton, there are, are four uh, main runway lengths that come into play. So in starting with the small aircraft, and again, the AC defines small as, as those that are less than 12,500 pounds. Uh, for those small aircraft, um, the, the runway length that applies is 3,870 feet. Uh, so the existing 4,000 foot runway um, it is serving those just, just fine. For small aircraft, again, under 12,500 pounds that have more than 10 passenger seats, um, there's a separate chart, there's a separate runway length, and, and that results in a length of 4,200 feet. So, so just over the existing 4,000 foot runway. When you move into aircraft that weigh more than 12,500, and those are um, largely the jet and the turboprop jet, or turboprop aircraft that operate at the airport, uh, there's, there's separate runway lengths that come for those. So when we're talking about turboprops, um, the length that results is 4,730 feet. And when we're talking about the jets, there's a 15% increase that the advisory circulator um, adds on that adds another 710 feet that takes the length to 5,440. So when we look at these ranges of runway length, our next step is then to look at, well, how many operations are, are occurring uh, for these different groups of, of aircraft? And, and then we have to consider what the FAA calls the regular use threshold. Um, and, and that's defined as 500 or more uh, annual operations um, occurring. So, what we've done in this table to the right here is we've, we've looked at those four different groups and, and, and from those that are the most demanding in terms of runway length to, to those that are least. And if we look at just the jet aircraft that are over 12,500 pounds, by themselves, they, they have not accounted, they have not um, added up to, to more than 500 operations a year. And so what we do then is, is we go, well, what is the next um, most demanding group of aircraft? And it's the turboprop aircraft that are greater than 12,000. And when you add the jet and the turboprop aircraft, uh, those don't add up to 500 uh, operations a year either. Uh, it came close in 2010, there were, there were 470. Um, so then we go to the next most demanding group, which is again, those, those 12,500 aircraft, uh, pound aircraft with 10 or more passenger seats. And, and when we consider um, those, we do then eclipse that 500 um, operation threshold. So if we're looking at just current operations uh, or operations even within the past five and 10 years that we're showing here, um, you can look and say, well, there is some support for a small extension to that primary runway. If we look at the broader um, out years, you know, should 
operations of those jet and turboprop aircraft that, that operate there now, should they eclipse that 500 operation threshold over the 20 year planning horizon, those longer runway lengths, you know, um, you come into play. And, and so um, that's something that we will look at in the alternatives again, um, and, and just to look at it. And, and, and so the city understands, you know, what is involved in, in going to a runway length of, the, of that magnitude. So um, with that discussion on length, and again, we can circle back to this stuff because I know there'll probably be more questions on that. I, I wanna now shift to, to, to runway wind coverage. And Greg, uh, before you shift, this is Mark Opitz, before yep. you shift, I had meant to say at the beginning of the meeting that anybody who is not able to follow along on a computer screen is more than welcome to uh, view the presentation on our website. I uploaded it uh, there prior to the meeting. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, no, um, that's great. Um, so uh, wind coverage, uh, the, the important thing about wind coverage is planes um, land and take off into the wind. And for the smaller aircraft, uh, you know, the smaller an aircraft is, the more susceptible it is to crosswind um, issues. And so the FAA has guidance on, on wind coverage and, and there's different um, you know, gusts, uh, wind knots, the uh, categories that are listed here, um, 10 and a half knots, 13 knots, 16 and 20. And when we look at the higher wind conditions, those in the 20 knot, the 16 knot and the 13 knot, um, the primary runway has, has adequate coverage for those wind conditions. And, and, and what the FAA considers adequate is 95% uh, of the time, you know, the runway is capturing the, the winds in, uh, for those conditions. However, when you look at the, 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 the less, um, the, the 10 and a half knot winds, uh, that the runway does not have 95% coverage for those. And so then the question is, well, what, what aircraft are, are susceptible to those kind of wind conditions from a crosswind standpoint? And if you go to the FAA's guidance, it's the A1 and B1 type aircraft. And, and those aircraft are um, illustrated, a couple of examples are illustrated in the bottom right hand corner here. Uh, the Cessna SR-22 is an example of an A1. Uh, the Cessna 340 is an example of a, of a B1 that, that make you know, significant use of the airport. And when we look at aircraft um, in that grouping, uh, an appropriate runway length is 3,280. And you know, if we're looking at the uh, crosswind runway is supported and, and trying to make it as usable um, year round um, to folks, some consideration of paving, you know, if we're gonna lengthen that runway, paving it so that it can be accommodated uh, by a wider group and, and year round is, is, is something to, that we think should be considered uh, as we move into alternatives. Um, so that, that's um, what I wanted to talk about for, for both the primary runway and the crosswind runway. Uh, I now want to talk about the taxiways. Uh, in general, the taxiways, um, are, are, they meet standards for width and, and separation and, and the safety critical areas that are associated with them. There were a couple of geometry improvements that were identified in the chapter. Uh, one of the most um, significant, I would think, in terms of the FAA is this direct connection that exists between the apron and the runway. Uh, the FAA has, has looked at that as a, a potential safety issue. Uh, they don't like the, um, the potential for an aircraft to sort of wander off the apron and then um, inadvertently find themselves closer to the runway or, or within the runway. And, and so what they want aircraft to do is, is be forced to sort of make these turns. And so I think this segment of taxiway between the runway and taxiway is fine. Uh, but this small connecting piece between the taxiway and the apron, uh, if that could simply be eliminated, um, you know, and that would force these aircraft to kind of turn. Um, and so I think there's a, a fairly simple solution there. Uh, one of the other things that's been identified is um, the taxi lane F over on the east side. There's quite a bit of traffic in and out of this area uh, as, um, as, as the specialized airport service operator, the Sasso Capital Flight is over there. Um, so to the extent, you know, another entrance or, or circulation can be approved over here. Uh, that's something that we think is, is worth looking at. And then um, the other thing that was um, brought to, to light in the chapter is the turning dimensions um, 
have been upgraded by the FA, how, how they've um, implemented those. And so there's some long tapers and some transition points. And so this exhibit is really trying to illustrate you know, what is out there in terms of existing turning transitions versus what the FA guidance is. And so there are some locations out there um, where that, that pavement may need to be widened. Um, moving on to the terminal apron. Uh, the apron is, is really in, in pretty good shape in terms of capacity and, and the number of parking positions it provides. Um, there's, there's good uh, taxi lane separation for access to the terminal and the FBO for those B2 aircraft. Um, what we did see is as you reach the out years for, for the planning, um, it does start to reach capacity. So I, I guess a recommendation is, you know, for some of these areas that are adjacent to the apron, uh, it may be prudent to reserve some of that space for additional aircraft parking um, in the in the long term in the out years. Uh, so when we're looking at, at the runways and the taxiways and the aprons, all those pavements, um, we wanted to look at the pavement strength and condition. Um, each, every three years, the Bureau of Aeronautics um, hires a firm to come out and, and, and evaluate the pavements uh, through a, what's called a pavement condition index. And, and they develop these maps. And, and so green are, are, are great. It's kind of like a stoplight sort of um, uh, metric. Um, red are, 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 are the worst end. And so you can see uh, quite a bit of the, the runway is, is, is nice and green. Uh, the taxiways and aprons are kind of turning that green to yellowish color. One thing to keep in mind is all these pavements or majority of these pavements were all constructed in 2003 and they were all of the same um, section. So over the course of the 20 year planning horizon, it's, it's likely that they'll all start needing um, re rehab um, roughly around the same time. So I think the message is you know, for the airport to be thinking about that and to not be sort of overwhelmed uh, when these when these pavements start reaching, you know, the, the rehab point to be trying to think about that and, and planning for that in advance. Um, so that's it on, on the on the airfield. Uh, I now want to talk about the the nav aids, the approaches, and the airspace. Uh, the airport is is serviced by a range of of, of navigational aids. Um, many of them visual that are shown here that consists of like the rotating beacon, uh, the wind cone. Uh, you know, the edge lights, the signage, things that assist the pilot in the, their situal awareness of the airfield. The airport is also equipped with uh, a number of electronic nav aids, um, and these um, enable uh, approaches to the airport, and, and they also offer weather reporting. Um, and so when we're talking about the approaches that are available at the airport, um, what we're talking about are non-precision instrument approaches. And what that means are they're mostly, um, a lot of them are GPS based. Um, and, and, and some of those GPS approaches um, offer not only lateral guidance, uh, left and right, um, but they also offer vertical guidance for, for some of them. And to the extent those approaches are available really depends on the weather conditions. And there's two primary things that are that come into play. One is the height of the of the clouds, the, the cloud ceiling above ground, and the other is the, the visibility distance. And, and when we look at the, the GPS approach procedures that are available at Middleton, the ones that offer the lowest cloud ceiling are, are 400 feet, and the ones that offer the lowest visibility are, are one mile. Now, those are associated with ones that don't provide vertical guidance. Um, when, when you're looking at the approaches that have vertical guidance, the minimum weather conditions are increased. So it's, you, know, you have to um, have better weather conditions to, to utilize the, the vertical guidance. And one thing that really controls what those minimums are for the approaches are the presence of, of obstructions in, in the airspace. And we, as part of the master plan, as part of developing the ALP, uh, we need to account for the obstructions and we need to depict those in the airport layout plan. And, and as we've um, done that work and, and worked with our sub consultants on, on doing that, uh, you know, there are numerous obstructions that, that surround the airport. And, and those obstructions can um, restrict you know, how usable those approaches are by, by requiring greater weather conditions. Um, so again, we are going to show those obstructions on the ALP um, and I guess our uh, we're thinking, you know, it's, it's prudent for the airport to, to look at those obstructions uh, and finding ways to mitigate the ones that are there 
and to uh, prevent future encroachments. Um, there are other factors that also limit um, the weather conditions on those approaches. And, and one of the, the big ones I wanna talk about is, is the primary surface. So there, there are various components of the airspace. The primary surface is the one that's nearest and closest to the runway. And for the visibility minimums that are at the airport right now, the one mile visibility minimums, the width of that primary surface is, is 500 feet. And that, and that really sets sort of the building restriction line, how close those buildings can be to the runway. If you try to lower the visibility minimums to three quarter mile, that primary surface widens from 500 feet to 1,000 feet. And so what we're really trying to illustrate with these two lines is, you know, a lot of the infrastructure that's in place out here, the hangars, the fuel farm, the terminal itself, were built with um, that setback for one mile in mind to try to lower it um, to three quarter of a mile. You can see that there's quite a bit of buildings and such that would, would come into play. So as such, we, we think it'd be very difficult uh, over the 20 year planning horizon to get minimums um, down to three quarters. Uh, you, you may be able to get something slightly less than a mile. I, I have seen airports that have like a seven eighth mile, um, but by and large, I think that having that primary surface restricted to 500 feet is gonna be a, a long-term limitation. Um, now I wanna talk about aircraft storage. Um, from the, the chapter and, and from the forecast, an additional 25 aircraft are projected to be based at the airport um, over the 20 year horizon. And when we look at um, trying to accommodate aircraft, we're not talking just about the, the hangar itself, uh, but there's a host of other things that, that need to come into play. There's, there's utilities that need to feed that hangar, uh, land side access, roads and parking, and then, and then the air side access. Um, how do the aircraft get from the hangar to the airfield? And so um, when we looked at the fleet mix of the additional aircraft and the typical um, requirements associated not only of the structure, but the land side and, and air side, um, you add that all up. Um, about a 12 acre area would be needed uh, to support um, those 25 additional aircraft. I um, want to touch a little bit on the terminal, the FPO and support facilities to, to conclude the, the presentation here. Um, the terminal and the FBO are, are, are combined um, and, and they're in um, pretty good, good shape. Uh, the, there is um, space within the, the terminal for, for growth. Uh, there was for a long time a restaurant in there um, that is um, not currently being being occupied. Um, and with that, um, there's a, some space east of the terminal, this, this 7,000 square foot area that has been sort of looked at for hangars and, and for other uses. Um, while the terminal and the FBO are in, are in good shape and we think will serve the airport well, uh, well into the, the planning horizon, um, we think it's prudent to preserve that space for additional terminal growth or additional FBO growth over the long term. Um, it's, it's just in, in a prime spot, it's got great community access, um, great parking. Um, we think the highest and best use for that is, is really um, of that nature. In terms of support facilities, um, those are things like the electrical vault, um, the SRE maintenance storage building, the fuel farm. Um, those are really uh, new or, or in good and adequate condition. Um, they're in good, uh, they're sited well on the airport. They're in a good location. Um, the message really, I think for, for all these facilities is to sort of preserve space around them uh, for, for future growth and expansion, um, but no, no real needs um, for those. Some things we did identify as things to be considered for support facilities are the installation of a, a deer fence. Um, there's a, a chain link security fence around much of the, um, what I would say, the developed side of the airport, the, the south side of the airport. But for the north side that, that abuts, you know, the farming operations and things, there, there is no um, security barrier there. And we think, you know, a, a, a deer fence would, one, provide that um, total secured loop around the whole airport, but also act as a, a deterrent to prevent you know, wildlife from um, encroaching on, on the airfield. Uh, and then one of the other things we had identified was trying to provide a, a service road that improves connectivity to the, to the East Hangar area. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on was, was utilities. Um, the airport's 
uh, serviced by a lot of the traditional utilities, you know, uh, water, uh, sanitary, uh, electric, gas, um, uh, and those should all be maintained, you know, over the long term. One of the, the things that really jumps out to me is, is the, the storm sewer utilities on the airport, in particular, um, those that convey Pheasant Banch Creek uh, under the airfield. Uh, we know there's been some really unprecedented flooding events, and the airport has seen um, some isolated spots where there's been settlement, where these, these pipes um, cross the runway. And, and so uh, really important to, to monitor that and to maybe look at opportunities to extend these pipes further away from the runway, uh, maybe a more robust headwall uh, to be, be better able to accommodate those, those high water flooding events. Last thing I wanna mention is in terms of utilities is the airport sits on the border of the urban service area boundary. And if we're talking about uh, you know, additional hangars or, or any additional developments, um, some amendment of that urban service area would be likely um, and should be something to, to consider with, uh, with the alternatives as well. So that really concludes um, my overview. I know this was very high level. Um, Robert, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now to, um, I guess I'll stop sharing and, and maybe turn it back to you to um, take it from here. Great, uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Comments or questions? Bob or Tom, you know, I have uh, a couple of items I wanted to check on. Um, what I think is very important, of course, is having a, a safe airport and benefits everybody, the pilots as well as the residents. And uh, of course, that's the primary mission of the FAA anyway, is to ensure that safe, efficient use. Uh, and just to follow up on what uh, Greg said, as far as the things he identified, I just want to uh, also highlight those as things that I think would be priorities to achieve those uh, objectives of a safe airport. Um, we've got, of course, the RPZ that he mentioned. Uh, there's the runway 119 safety area, the alternative turf landing area, removal and relocation of taxiway A2, runway taxiway pavement rehab, replacement of existing incandescent uh, runway and taxiway lighting with LED, enhancing taxiway fillets when if 500 annual TDG2 aircrafts are achieved, taxiway F congestion mitigation, acquisition of additional property for aircraft storage, obstruction, uh, they uh, perimeter fencing and uh, drainage improvements uh, so I think those things that, that do need to be uh, uh, high priority items. Uh, the highest of those, I would say, though, would be the RPZ zone, particularly on runway R, uh, R, excuse me, R runway 01 RPZ. Um, according to FAA, they say the airport donor must have sufficient interest in the runway protection zones to protect the runway protection zone from both uh, obstructions and incompatible land use. Finally, the airport owner must strive to attain compatible zoning around the airport in order to prevent incompatible land uses that could cause sufficient conflict that endangers the airport, cause it to be closed, or require substantial remedial investment to purchase conflicting developed property. And uh, as uh, Greg had mentioned, uh, there are those uh, parcels over at the corner of Deming and uh, Airport Road as well as the public roads that uh, he had mentioned. Um, and the FAA defines sufficient interest as the first and preferred method is for the airports to purchase the approach areas in, uh, in fee, ownership in fee is preferred because it provides maximum control for the airport. Second is through purchase of an easement or, com or combination of easement and zoning. Third is to rely upon adequate zoning, which should be enacted even if fee or easement uh, ownership is in place. Um, and uh, it, it further states that until the current our runway 01 configuration can be altered or the one we closed, the airport sponsor should contact the owner of each parcel and purchase, purchase a navigation easement to preserve the integrity of our PC and um, 
It says that in the longer term, such property within the RPZ requires extremely restrictive easement agreements due to the limited use of property. A fee simple purchase of the property, a fair value, is the most viable solutions. Um, and I understand there are bending court cases where the impact of an airport on private properties constitutes a regulatory uh, taking. Uh, so um, I think it'd be a good idea if that would be number one on uh, the priorities for when we get to discussing alternatives. Uh, now, I, I've got information uh, elaborating on the other items I mentioned, uh, and I can provide that if needed, but I thought I would concentrate on this because that's the most important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hang on. I'm... Used to I noticed. Uh, I noticed, Greg. You, you spent a number amount of minutes on that. Now, I agree. I think that's the thing that we really have to tackle first, because there are so many things involved. Busy public road. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the uh, facilities near uh, the airport that are occupied, and other things. Okay. Great. Thanks, Bob. Um, I see Rich Mori has his hand up. Rich, go ahead. Yep, just a new development. The uh, the old Scott's pastry that had been confectionique is now going to be uh, has been leased to uh, uh, tenants that already had uh, space in the building. So Rapid Imaging will be moving their uh, their operation from the two fur furthest west offices in the terminal to the. Uh, uh, that space and then those two offices. One will probably be used by the airport. The other one is going to be up for lease, or excuse me, for more airplane company. The other might be up for lease. Just to give you a heads up on that. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Rich. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Hey, it's, uh, it's Mark Warshower. So, uh, Rich, could you shed any light on what sort of communication or um, information that has been conveyed to the to the buildings and the owners of the zero one approach RPZ do they know that they're an RPZ or what well, give us some history on you know when when that airport was built those buildings weren't there and uh, they got built anyway so help, help us understand that to Bob's point well um, I know that the uh, the Blattner Group is well aware of the situation. The only reason I know that is in dealing with uh, the gentleman in charge of the, the area when we took down the tree that was, and they were happy to give us permission to take that tree down. But they do know that that is a, a potential conflict with uh, selling that uh, lot immediately across and had <clears throat> urged us at that time if uh, we were going to do any um, uh, work on a crosswind runway to uh, move the threshold far enough north to take that out of uh, contention, at least at a at a lower, you know, a, a single story type building that's a predominant over there with a lot of the office space. So they're aware of it. I don't, I'm not, I know uh, Mr. Blettner was very aware of the developments that happened at the airport and was quite against them, um, but uh, the, uh, that uh, did not prevail. So uh, that, that's really about all I know about it, but I do, uh, they do, are aware of it and uh, they've made their preference known. But uh, other than that, uh, there is no, nothing going on to my knowledge. Robert, I can, I can add to that. It's Mark. Please go ahead, Mark. So uh, Bob Blettner has been in communication with the city about this. He said, and he was correct in this, there's no recollection of the city paying for air rights, which confirms that unless we have such documentation, the RPZ, if it covers lots south of Airport Road, would require compensation. So he, we are in communication with Robert, with Bob, excuse me, about this. Um, we're waiting to see what the master plan recommends in terms of you know, if the city should take any steps towards uh, protecting the RPZ along the lines of what Mr. Bartholomew said. Hey, Greg, it's Mark Warshower again. So hypothetically, and I saw that you wrote in there that we might want to reorient the, the 0119 runway. And if we did, 
Um, of course, we'd need to consider what the RPZ would be under that uh, um, that runway that's just say a 3618 sort of orientation. Um, and, you know, what would be, if not within the RPZ, certainly close to it. And I think that soccer, I can't remember what it's called, that soccer field that's there. I drive by it every day, but. Um, Eva Sports Center, maybe? Or... Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just I think we need to, that, that go, I understand that goes in the alternative section, but uh, I just thought we want to make sure that that was um, included in it if, as, a, as an issue. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think our, our intent will be to look at um, ways to, to deal with the RPZ either through, you know, um, control of the land itself or by um, opportunities to, to change the runway, either, either to realign, uh, shift, uh, close the runway. Um, you know, those are, I think, are all, all alternative to um, address the RPZ that we'll, we'd be looking at going into the next next chapter. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe the next hand up is Julie. Um, Julie, go ahead. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to ask Greg a follow-up question. Um, am I understanding you correctly when you're analyzing the um, jet and turbo product prop operations by weight group that there have been flights of uh, flight operations that have occurred that are landing with less than the recommended um, runway length currently? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's, that's a, a good question. Um, I think some of it has to do with um, the maximum takeoff weight uh, of the aircraft. So um, yeah, you know, are those um, aircraft uh, able to leave with less fuel, with less passengers, um, to be able to operate on, on the runway. Um, the way we've looked at it is, is the maximum takeoff weight and then following FAA guidance. So, um, but yeah, I, I think- So you're, basically you're, right. you're saying we don't know whether they've been doing this all, all along for the last five years, because I'm, I, I really want to understand this. If well, you don't I, I, know, it's okay to say you don't know. I just want I just want you to to tell me. I just want to make sure I'm understanding you, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I don't know like the conditions of, of every jet and 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 then turboprop operation where they're going or or you know how many passengers and such they're carrying. Um, the way we've we've structured it is um, you know assuming maximum takeoff weight, uh, FA guidance. But you're right, you know there are those jets that weigh more than twelve thousand five hundred that that do operate there. Um, and you know, I think some of it too has to do with weather conditions. You know, if if the um, if the weather conditions are, are right and, and the pavement isn't contaminated, you know, that all sort of plays into the accessibility of the airport. So, um, it, your point is a good one. You know, I, I understand what you're 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 saying, um, but I think there are other sort of things that come into to play in terms of whether a pilot is. Um, you know, if they think they can t make an operation work. And I think a lot of it depends on where they're going, you know, what their, what their loads are and, uh, and what the conditions are of, of, the, of the field. So you're just saying it's, you, we don't really have any, uh, any data on that and it's a pilot by pilot decision, flight operation by flight operation decision. Is that correct? I would think, uh, and I'll let Rick or, or Barbara maybe uh, from Eden on help jump in here, to, but I, I think that's that's correct. I think for every operation, a pilot has to look at um, where he's going, you know, what what the weight of, of um, you know, his passenger load is and, and what the weather conditions are. And I think that's a an operation by operation calculation and, and maybe other pilots could, could jump in on that. But I, I believe that's a, a true statement. Hey, Greg. Mm -hmm. This is Jade speaking. Um, yep. Just as a pilot, I thought I'd jump in here on a couple things. One of which is sometimes, in excuse me, insurance dictates as well uh, landing minimums. So the aircraft may be able to land safely in 3,000 feet, but if insurance requires a 4,000 foot or a 4,200 foot runway, that airplane is going elsewhere. Um, the second thing, as Greg pointed out, which is impossible to track, would be the weight load of the aircraft and how much fuel it has on board, how many bags, how many people. 
So, you know, an aircraft may be able to depart one day safely or land safely on 4,000 feet and the very next day couldn't possibly take off or land there. And there, there's just no way to track that. And, and also, I think the, the main, this is Kevin here, the, the, the answer is it's, it's solely the pilot in command's responsibility to ensure that they're operating within compliance within the constraints of that flight. It's, it's clearly defined in part 91, part 121, part 135. So this is not something that the airport management monitors it's 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 not something that the airport commission monitors or meet and hunt it's the pilot and command's sole responsibility to ensure that they're operating within the constraints of the runway the airplane the within the, what we call the envelope of the airplane and, and many other things i'm sure rich can chime in on this thank too. you and i just thank you i think it's my questions have been answered thanks Okay, thank you very much. And, and um, the next two people on the list, I, uh, Mark's hand went up next and then Rich Maury had his hand up too. So I'll call on Mark first. No, I, I had my hand up to speak about Bob Letner earlier. Oh, so, well then, uh, Rich. Sorry. We have to remember to put our hands down, but mine is up. So. <laughs> thank you, Rich. Uh, go ahead, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, it is a uh, um, statutory. Uh, it is a violation to uh, take off or land at an airport at other than an emergency that the aircraft um, performance uh, envelope does not support. So if someone were to come in and overload an airplane and try to take off, that, that's an uh, area that the FAA enforces and rigorously if there's any issues. Um, but uh, again, it's not something that we uh, have any power to police. Okay, thank you very much, Rich. Uh, the next hand I see up is Cynthia. Cynthia, go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so first of all, I wanna compliment uh, Mead and Hunt on uh, referencing in chapter three, the Polko survey number one results for question number 17, where 93% of the current Maury Airport users responded that the current length of primary runway 1028 at C29 uh, did not pose a constraint to their operation. And that 84% said that the current runway length was either excellent or good. So I really appreciate that. And I'd like to ask Greg, uh, I'm curious as to why uh, you did not study the number of hours on an annual basis in which the airport is experiencing instrument meteorological conditions below the approach minimums currently at C29. Essentially, do conditions impairing the ability to get into the airport happen often enough to warrant the investment in lower minimums that you mentioned? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think it's something we, we could look at. Um, I think what I was trying to sort of allude to is that I think there are already um, quite a bit of things that limit um, the, the minimums on that runway. You know, again, how, how close the buildings have been built, uh, the presence of obstructions. Um, but your comment is a good one, Cynthia, and I think it, it probably wouldn't be uh, a bad thing to, to look at, you know, um, what are the, the percentage of times where uh, the weather conditions are lower? I'm not sure the, the minimums can be lowered um, much anyway. But um, I think it's a, a valid comment. I appreciate it. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I don't see any other hands. Uh, is there any other committee member who maybe is calling from a phone or doesn't have the ability to raise their hand electronically who wishes to speak or ask questions? Uh, Dan Drazen, can you hear me? Yeah, get, Dan, go ahead. You have the floor. Uh, I got one question on uh, stormwater management. Uh, we all remember the flood, or most of us should, but do uh, most of the committee know that during that event, the upper watershed, we did not get nearly the rain that Middleton got during that flood in Springfield. So you didn't have nearly the water coming through from Springfield that you could have had. So if you're gonna be putting this many more hangers up, and this much more impervious surface, 
how are you going to deal with it? Okay. Uh, thanks for your question. I don't know um, if this is, would this be something that we would address under chapter three, Greg, or is that more in? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think um, in, any project um, where we're adding impervious or we're, we're changing or we're, we're grading, I mean, we're going to have to look at what the, the stormwater ordinance and requirements are um, and, and um, you know, in terms of um, maintaining and reducing, you know, peak flows and, and, and so volume. And, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a great comment um, and, and maybe worth adding, you know, in addition to things that we've identified in terms of like amending an urban service area, um, you know, there, there may be some other um, stormwater management things that would need to, to come into play with, with um, additional developments as well. So I think that's a, a good comment and something we could add in as a, something that the city is going to need to consider if they're looking at these things. So. Great. Thanks. Robert, um, oh, yes. I, I have a quick question for Greg. Go ahead, Kevin. You have the Thank floor. You. Hey, hey, Greg. Um, so, so you know, this is regarding the north-south crosswind runway in, in the in the forecast. Do you, do you anticipate um, as an alternate providing some runway length on that crosswind runway if it's if it's repositioned and and paved, et cetera? Because it is whether it's two thousand or three thousand feet, it is an alternate as far as shifting, you know, touch and go type traffic for the lighter planes, the A1 and B1s, um, where there's less traffic over residential areas. What were you anticipating providing? I know that, that you were looking at 4,200 feet for the, uh, the east-west runway. Were you anticipating adding a runway length in the, in the forecast for that crosswind runway? It, you know, it's, it's a great comment. And I know there's been other folks who have brought that idea up is, you know, maybe the, the place for the, that length is, is in the north south direction. Um, and, and I think there is some good things to think about there. So yeah, I, I think we've talked with the Bureau of Aeronautics about that. I know um, other folks have, have brought that up. So I, I think that is worth looking at. Um, and, and I think that is a direction that we would head with the alternatives if, if that makes sense to the the, the impact folks here. I'd, I'd be willing to kind of hear others' thoughts on that here too. That'd be great. Okay, the next hand I see up is Julie. Uh, Julie, go ahead. Yes, and I would like to ask that people raise their hands because actually I had my hand raised long before, you know, you, we went on to this other discussion because I wanted to add something to what Mr. Drazen and um, Greg were talking about. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to be flipping back to what we were talking about with the floodwaters. I had marked that just to just to ask um, Greg, it is true you refer to that as a historic flooding event, the, the, the August 2018 um, event that had quite an impact on the city of Middleton. But I know probably everybody sitting here realizes that climate scientists have concluded that these extreme weather events are going to, like these August 2018 storm is going to recur. So I would like to ask Mark, um, because he's a city planner, as well as you, Greg, although I think you've kind of answered your portion of it, how does the city envision handling more um, paved areas and as Dan referred to um, just more building going up in that area because it's not I don't think this is a one-off event I don't think any climate scientist would say that flood wasn't necessarily a one-off event so could somebody answer that for me please I can take a shot since uh, you called on me Julie yeah I would um, you a city person sure, here you know sure sure happy to so we have an intergovernmental agreement with the town of Springfield that we entered into, uh, I'm going to say 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly, but it's been a while, 15, 20 years maybe. And um, that calls for the preservation, long-term preservation for ag um, in this part of the, you know, north of the airport, essentially. So one of the reasons for that was to respect the town's uh, wish to remain agricultural in that area. This was an intergovernmental agreement, so it was collaborative. Um, but also it accomplishes the objective of uh, 
limiting development north of the airport. One of the reasons the city purchased the airport was to have it be a buffer between the urban area, the urbanizing area of the city of Middleton and the agricultural area of Springfield. So uh, that's one answer. The second is we have, of course, uh, stormwater ordinances that Greg alluded to already. Uh, and I'm not our stormwater engineer, but um, working with the Capital Area Regional Planning Commission, we have um, obviously an obligation regionally um, and then also within the city to make sure we mitigate any impervious area in our stormwater uh, in our, uh, that, that gets added to the um, drainage basin. Um, Dane County, of course, has been showing interest in, in helping communities around the county with that as well. That's one of the reasons why that was cited for the acquisition by the county of the acre farm um, next to Pheasant Branch Conservancy. So the city is always looking for ways to uh, enhance uh, recharge of the present of the aquifer that's under the city. And uh, you know, not we don't want to do any harm to our, our uh, environment with uh, the stormwater you know, increased flows. So um, I can't give you a more specific answer because I'm not an engineer, but it's something we're very attuned to. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, thanks, Julie. And and just so everybody is aware, I'm I'm trying to play this this balance on who I choose to speak next. Partly on the fact that not everybody's calling in from a computer, and so I don't know if they're calling in from a phone whether they even have the ability to raise their hand. So I'm giving some people a little bit of deference if they call, if they just speak up and say I'd like to speak. So please thank you for your comments, and please understand that I'm just trying to uh, find a happy balance. Okay, thanks. Um, any other people who would like to speak or ask questions from the committee? Um, actually, I'm going to ask a question or two, and I'll try to keep it short. I tend to get into minutia, as people know I do, um, who know me. And Mark is saying, no, couldn't possibly be. Um, just little things. I have a question in when we do, when we list in the report certain um, number of operations, projected operations, like on, I think it was page 3 2 near the very beginning of the report, things like the ASV um, for runway 1028. Uh, there's an odd number of operations, and I noticed this in chapter two as well. And I understand how math works. And when you're doing averaging and, and calculating, you don't always add up and end up at a nice round number or even an even number. But I see a lot of odd numbers. And by my understanding of things, operations pretty much happen in twos. You, if you're if you're a plane from who's an itinerant plane not based at this airport, you fly in and you land, and then you fly out and you uh, leave. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the, all of the touch and goes um, count as a single operation. But I'm just curious: is it, it, every place that we have an odd number of operations, is that reasonable, or you know, is that just a calculation uh, artifact? And and really, operations mainly happen in twos and fours and sixes. Just a point. Can somebody answer if I'm just wrong to say that? rounding to the nearest even number might be worthwhile. Uh, Robert, this is Greg. I mean, I'll just touch on it real quickly. I, I think you're um, you're right on. I mean, I, I think, yeah, a lot of this is, is the math and how the math comes out and, and, and things like that. One of the things I would say is when we look at um, the uh, instrument operations, when we were trying to get a handle on that, um, how those are reported by the FAA, sometimes you end up with, um, a number of, of uh, departures that's different than the number of arrivals. Okay. And, and so what the FAA has um, allowed us to do, um, the Chicago EDO anyway, is to say, well, look, take, take the higher number and, and then multiply it by two, because like, like you're saying, if an aircraft comes, uh, they're going to leave and, and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, 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 I know what you're saying and, and I think um, it, it does make sense. Um, I'm not going to make you change the report. I mean, <laughs> as, as you work on future chapters, it's something to keep in mind that operations don't seem to be 
don't seem to typically happen in odd numbers. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, another thing, uh, just for the report on, on page 3.6, um, under section 3.3.1, it says runway configuration. And through, you know, it, it, it's, this is basically a quote right out of um, uh, an advisory, but it, it says um, runway separation must take into account blah, blah, blah. And then it says near, near the bottom of the paragraph says, if, if the RSA of one runway overlaps onto the full strength pavement of a second runway, blah, blah, blah. And I believe RSA is defined later on in this chapter, but this was the first use of it. And I had to struggle to find out what RSA was at that point of the uh, yeah. report. So I yeah. might ask that even though you can't add it into a quote, maybe someplace above the quote, we could add in a definition of RSA just so the casual reader doesn't have to go scratching their head. No, that's, that, that's a great comment. And, and uh, I agree, we can, we can spell that out. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I think I just had one or two more and I, again, I apologize. Um, I think, Oh, I, I think I know where, yeah, here. Um, now I'm looking at something called page 54. And I don't know if that's on the same numbering scheme as I was just on. It's a, it's a big map. And it, it came up, it came to my attention when you were discussing, um, let's see, what, what's around this, let me. Uh, the yeah, airspace maybe in obstructions um, yeah ter well, this one terminal apron oh yeah, thank you that exactly what's on the screen right now oh. you had greg you had mentioned earlier that um one of the considerations was possibly i think to remove uh one of these access points to the um to the taxi lane, if I have that terminology correct, um, it, as as it, it's it's not typically uh, ideal to have people have a direct access from the apron across a taxi lane and potentially directly over to the um, the actual runway. And then I saw here on figure 313, terminal apron inventory, parking and circulation space. And I just wanted to verify or have you uh, check with your team if that were, if this one entrance point to the taxiway were removed to um, assist, you know, or, or, or prevent people from just crossing over the taxiway onto the runway, uh, does that also screw up maybe the parking and circulation space? Because obviously there's a lot going on in those yellow lines right in this, um, I guess I call it the second from the right entrance to the taxiway. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great point. I mean, I, I think one of the easiest, the low cost solutions, again, is to just to simply remove that pavement. Um, but but you're right, Robert, I mean, it, it, by removing that, you know, we, we've cut off a uh, an access point to the apron and, and, and sort of, it, you know, decrease the, the circulation. Another option that we could consider is, is to shift it westward. Um, and, and there is some space, you know, there to do that. So I think as we go into alternatives, um, that'd be maybe another thing to consider. You know, one is to remove it, another is to, to shift it. Um, but the idea, again, really to, to force aircraft to make those turns to not be able to just wander um, inadvertently, um, especially during foggy conditions and things like that, you know, from the apron to to, to a place that they're um, where they're too close or they're entering the runway environment. So, yeah, I think that's a, a great great thing that we can take into alternatives. Another way to address it. Okay, thank you. I just uh, like I said, I, I that one I just came to me during the, the presentation today. So thank you for. Yeah. Um, your, thank you for your comments. Okay. I have no further questions, but I see a couple of new hands have come up. So the next na next person I'm going to call on is John Schaefer. And John, you are muted. 
Sorry, thank you. Greg, you're talking about the one in 19 runway and, and some of the issues about crossing over the, the, the other main runway. And I'm just wondering because the uh, protection zone actually goes so far south, how far would you have to move that runway north to actually get it to where you could have operations that weren't having the two runways impinge on one another? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I believe we we listed the dimension of that RPZ. I want to say the RPZ length itself is, is a thousand feet. Um, so, I mean, I'm just looking at it here. I mean, to, to try to get that RPZ pulled onto airport property, I would guess we'd need to move that that runway end by, you know, 700 feet or so northward uh, okay. to have it, you know, totally on airport property. It, it seems like a large density. And then the other question is simply aeronautics question is, is it looks from the map like you would have more flexibility to go north if that runway was notched 10 degrees to the west. So it became a, a zero and 18 as opposed to one and 19. And I don't know what that would do to all your data about usage and stuff on that runway. Um, if, if I understand your, your comment, John, I, I think what you're saying is to try to make that runway maybe more uh, m due north. And, well, to, to be able to move it further north so that you can clear that, that crossover between the two runways. Right now, your protection zone starts to go in and off of the property onto other stuff because it's angled slightly to the northeast. If, it were to, if the runway itself were literally to go north, would you have more ability to move that runway further north? And, and ease that cross connection between 1028 and 119. It's just sort of general information. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a great, great idea. And I think, again, when we get into alternatives, I think we'd be looking at um, different extents, you know, um, like Kevin had said, um, you know, if we're, if we're serious about thinking about paving that north south, um, do we want to not only shift the, the south end up, um, but can we get it to a, a length that, you know, is, is more usable and, and if yeah. we pave it. So, yeah, I think, I think we'll be looking at a, a, a range of, of layouts and configurations of that north south to try to, um, you know, improve that safety on the south end and, and try to improve the, the utility of the runway in general. Okay, thank you. It was just informational stuff. Yeah, no, it's, I, I appreciate those are, are, are great things to to mention and, and and that's that's you know great feedback as we go into the the alternatives analysis and so yeah great thanks john um and then i see cynthia has her hand up cynthia you have the floor thank you very much bob uh i just have a uh, a couple of requests for i'm assuming chapter four alternatives will be the next chapter that we discuss in november is that right Greg Stern. Yes, um, you know I think the other thing we're really trying to um, put together is the environmental overview, and, and so I think what we'd like to to have for November is you know a, a, an overview of the in, environmental setting, you know things that we need to consider, and then yeah the 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 alternatives as well. So will the environmental overview also include the decibel levels of these B Roman numeral two aircraft? Uh, we are. We are trying, um, and as you may know, we are trying to um, put together the, the noise contours in advance of the November meeting for, for the existing conditions. And, and you know, we've, we've received a lot of good feedback from the surrounding neighborhoods. And um, you know, we, we very much appreciate um, the information folks have shared about you know, what they've seen and some of the flight tracking. So you know, the, the window of time for accepting those comments, is, it runs through this week. Um, our hope is that to, to try to take that data, really start, um, you know, taking that information into account and how we model those noise contours. But um, I think what I'm envisioning, Cynthia, is we would probably have the environmental overview minus the noise maybe turned around a little bit sooner, and then maybe something that would include the noise closer to the November date, because um, we're just going to need a little bit more time to kind of take that feedback from the community to to develop those contours. Okay, so can I just ask why uh, Mead and Hunt is not using actual flight track data from, I understand it's available for free through the FAA uh, that it pings off of uh, Dane County Regional Airport for C-29? Um, you know, I, I guess, Rick Dunkelberg, uh, are you, 
you know, our, as our noise expert, I, I guess I'm wondering um, if you could jump in here and, and what your experience has been with, with those. No, we uh, will. Yeah. Oh, am, I, am I okay? Yep. Okay. Um, no, we will be using that. But when we have a non-towered airport where we have that kind of information, which is sometimes, sometimes very accurate and sometimes not very accurate, we also like to get a community input on where they observe where aircraft fly, simply because they're on, the, the community is on the ground. They, they know where the aircraft fly. They know where they are annoyed by those aircraft. And we combine that information then with the flight tracking system. Now, one of the um, challenges we have is that because 2020 is such an anomaly year for everything, including aircraft flights, that we're going to use 2019 as <clears throat> the year to identify those flight tracks because that's a, that's a more representative annual uh, representation of where aircraft fly. So we'll be using so both of those. Yeah, so Rick, I know we had this conversation at the last ANPAC meeting. I'm just going to strongly encourage you because the Airport Commission changed the noise abatement procedure on June 4 of 2020, this year, which has substantially changed where these left turns are taking place to head south. It has pushed them further west. So if you only rely on 2019 data, that will not at all be reflected in that. So I'm just gonna please ask you again to look at the 2020 data for the new noise abatement procedure. I'd also like to ask that a right turn be evaluated as an alternative because the FAA has told me that probably would alleviate many of the citizen complaints about low repetitive and other overflights over houses that are very loud and annoying. Uh, and my, uh, I have a couple other just uh, requests. Um, when we do chapter four alternatives, if uh, eminent domain condemnation is going to be associated with any alternative being offered, I would ask that that be identified and that the municipality where the eminent domain condemnation uh, would be, whether it's town of Middleton or town of Springfield, be identified with some idea of how much land would have to be condemned in order for each different alternative, if it's applicable, to be uh, adopted. And then um, finally, I'm just curious as to what the tail draggers that use C29 and are kind of the heart and soul of the place, what they think about the possibility of paving and extending their turf runway. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for those questions. I don't know if there's any answers at this time or not. So you've got no feedback, Robert, from the tail draggers? Um, what, what I have heard just personally, um, and I haven't taken like a survey or anything, um, was that uh, obviously they prefer a, a turf runway but um, if, if, if there can be assurances that there could be a uh, turf landing or takeoff and landing, you know, uh, proximate to, next to um, uh, any runway, whether it's the, whether it's uh, 1028 or 0119, um, that would probably be an acceptable solution as well. So Robert, will that be in the alternatives analysis? These, if they do decide to, I mean, it sounds like they're gonna recommend pave and extend north south. Uh, will these uh, alternative turf areas be identified in chapter four alternatives? I will I will ask Mead and Hunt if that is po a possibility at, uh, based on current, <laughs> Uh, rules and, and opinions at the FAA. You know, I, I, I can touch on that a little bit, Robert. You know, I mean, there, there really are no like design standards of, of, about those sort of turf landing areas. I mean, I think um, as we develop the alternatives, I mean, I think we can sort of identify where the, the, the grass is and, and maybe illustrate how the safety areas for the taxiways and runways um, play out. You know, relative to that, and, and maybe there, maybe 
Um, but you know, it, it's it's kind of a, as we mentioned in the presentation, it's it's a the FAA's position on that is evolving. Uh, we know there are other airports that are, are looking at that too. So I think, you know, it's certainly something we can try to touch on and, and discuss as we're looking at, you know, from one alternative to the other. Maybe there is one that would facilitate, you know, a turf landing area better than another. Um, I'm just not sure how we would illustrate it, you know, on the on the alternative itself. Um, but I, I think it's certainly something that we could talk talk through as we're developing these alternatives. Yeah. I would encourage you to, to at least, yeah, have it be part of our conversation. Yeah. And then Cynthia, to answer your question, uh, my understanding is um, the the tailwheel, the the, the the pilots of tailwheel aircraft would really want some types of assurances um, that 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 if 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 this um, north south uh, runway were to go from a turf runway to a um, to a you know a fully paved runway, um, they would like to know what that would do to them, what their options would be, things of that nature. So I don't think that this is a, a settled issue at this time. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mark. I see you yes. have your hand up. Yeah, I'm wondering if if uh, Rich Mori. Uh, there was a question about the noise abatement procedures and I pulled from our city website uh, what the current procedures are that were adopted by the airport commission in June as Chair Richardson uh, referenced. And I just wanted to know if you felt Rich that planes are flying farther west as a result of this uh, published procedure. That's a good question, Mark. Uh, now that the temperature has dropped and we're getting a, a, a better performance, we're actually probably going to be turning inside the power lines more so in the summer with the uh, warmer temperatures and the aircraft climbing a little slower, uh, they would probably be turning, there would be more of them turning uh, outside of the power lines. Uh, this uh, procedure, which was in place well before the uh, uh, we went to trying to turn on the power lines, obviously was in place well before there were power lines. Uh, you know, we simply went back to it because, well, I won't go into, don't have to go into the details. The reality is they're at pattern altitude and throttle back before they turn. And uh, that is a, a minimum noise situation for the aircraft. Okay, great. Um, Cynthia, you, uh, you have your hand up, you have the floor. Yeah, I would just like to uh, give some real life flavor to what was just stated. Uh, I don't have the exact date, it was about two days ago. I don't know, I usually share this information with Mr. Mori uh, by email. Uh, 80 decibel planes going very low over Sunset Ridge Elementary School and many houses. So I guess when you are living here, you have a different experience than what was just explained to you even today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I don't, oh, I see Mark's hand, but I think that might be left up from before. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody who, from the committee who would like to, speak or ask questions on this topic. Julie, go ahead. Oh, Julie, you Actually may... not on this topic, I'm sorry. If you were switching to an, asking for other questions, I would have a question, I have another question, but if other people wanna join in this particular discussion, that's fine, go ahead. Um, I think you can go, I mean, if it's still related to the presentation and discussion of chapter three, I think you can go ahead and still maintain the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, sure. I just wanted to ask, Gray. I two things. Um, one, I it's un I just wanted to find out what exactly within this chapter three. There's a continued. There are several places, and and also in the discussion tonight about alternatives analysis. And I don't really understand. I, I would like to see clarification about precisely what that is. And I want to ask: Is it going into a separate chapter? In fact, in general, I'm 
unclear how many more chapters there are going to be and what this the whole shape of this draft is going to look like when we started this process originally quite a while ago it started out with a very um comprehensive overview of each chapter and and the timeline and i don't feel that same sense here i just like to get a little bit of both the specific question i ask about alternatives analysis and then the the overall view because this is the second meeting where i've been wondering what's coming when and i and don't really have a clue right now thank you sure yeah no um so i i think maybe one of the the best things to do would be to kind of look at how the the scope is is structured um for, for the master plan um that, oh and mark you pulled that okay great so yeah um so, so really, I think the the typical format for a master plan is is you know the the inventory chapters, the first. Uh, then we try to get the the forecast uh, developed, approved by the FAA. We use those forecasts to develop the requirements chapter that, that we've done now. Um, knowing what our requirements are, we then look at different <laughs> concepts um, to to address those those requirements, and, then, and that would be the the alternatives chapter. Um, what we would try to do in that alternatives chapter is, is develop a, a full range of alternatives. And we realized that one of them um, for, for any of these facilities we're talking about is, is the no action alternative. And, and what we'd we'll like to do is sort of identify through each of these, um, the various you know, pros and cons, uh, the merits and deficiencies with each alternative. And, and ideally, I think what we'd like to try to do is set up some, some sort of scoring you know, based on um, environmental considerations, operational considerations. You know, some of that is, is pretty spelled out in, in the scope. Um, but working through that alternatives analysis uh, in consideration of the environmental overview, um, you know, I think what we'd like to do from there in, in looking at the scoring is, is pick a preferred alternative, a preferred course of action. And, and once we have that preferred alternative, we then look at noise uh, associated with that. Uh, we're looking at um, capital improvements. Um, so um, once we know what, what the future is that we're gonna show in the airport, um, how does that play out over the 20 year horizon in terms of a capital improvement plan um, and funding and, and funding sources, environmental um, next steps. And, and then with that, I think that's kind of the final chapter of the master plan. The culmination of everything is the development of the air, airport layout plan. And so the airport layout plan itself is, you know, kind of depicting all the things that we've we've, we've talked about, that the preferred alternatives that we've selected, and the ALP is the document that the FAA ultimately has to to sign and approve. So I have um, a follow. Oh, I'm sorry. If you had more, go ahead. I just had a no, follow-up question. Yeah, no, that's. A, Please go ahead. Yeah. Well, you're going to do, you're going to select a preferred alternative and discuss it at the next meeting. Is that after? No, you've done? Oh, no, okay. no. Meet and Hunt is not selecting any preferred Somebody's alternative. Somebody's going to. Yes. Well, you're well, just going like, to set them out in the plan. Is that correct? We'd, we'd like it to be a, you know, a, a collaborative effort and, um, you know, a, a scoring and, and trying to um, find something that, you know, is a, uh, that we can get some consensus on. I mean, that, that would be the ideal situation. Within this committee. This, this committee is, is really, yeah, been trying to, you know, that's our, okay. our sounding board, yeah. Well, then the, the one comment that I would have back is that I think sometimes to the, the community that I represent, um, looking at alternatives without considering the environmental impacts and, and pushing that to the end and then doing the alternatives analysis and the environmental in one fell swoop is almost not discussing what matters to a lot of people as opposed to what matters to the airport planning process. But I think it is, I think one of the reasons we have this committee is to talk about those things. And I just wonder how people envision that going forward because I think it is a problem for this committee. I'm being very honest. I, I feel that a lot of people just don't think that those things are getting enough consideration and having them come right then when you're doing the alternatives analysis and having us come back and try to select a preferred alternative without having a really time to think about what's going on with the environmental 
things, I think that's going to be very hard for a community. And I just want to know what other people think. Um, uh, could, could I chime in based on my previous experiences doing this? Uh, Who Kevin? Is this Kevin? Kevin? Yeah, yeah this, this is Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. So this is just my previous experience um, back in the day, way back in the day out in Santa Clara, California, where we did the same thing. We had three airports. We were doing this. And so the, the alternatives ended up in the, in the final draft of the airport master plan. You, Greg, you've seen it. And that, that's just where they were left. Here, here are the alternatives. There wasn't one that was chosen so that if we pick this alternative, then if the airport grew this much, then it wouldn't do this. Or we pick this alternative, it would mean this. But they were just left as a series of these are the alternatives because we don't know if they're going to come to fruition. And even if they did, it would be years and then a years from now or decades from now, maybe. And um, but th that's just what they are. Here's the alternatives, right? Alternative one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, whatever there is. There wasn't a decision made on which one was the best or which one wasn't. That's that's the way we did it. And I and I think you I think we I can't remember. It's been so many years now. I think we used Mead and Hunt, but maybe we didn't. I don't remember. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Um are there any other comments or questions from the committee? Uh, this is Bob Bartholomew. Yeah, I was uh, curious to address this to uh, Greg, uh, since he would be doing the scheduling, uh, that we have one more meeting on November 19th. Is that correct? Or are there subsequent meetings? So yeah, our, our, our next meeting um, is, is November 19th. Um, and I think you know, in talking with, with city staff, uh, you know, the, the thought was you know, to try to have a, 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 an alternative sort of worked out or at least have all the alternatives, like Kevin said, laid out, even if we don't have a preferred one selected. Um, but once we have those alternatives, I think the next step was to kind of wait till after the holidays, come back after the first of the year and, and look at having another opportunity for, for public involvement. Um, public involvement would be a presentation, but I mean as far as the committee meeting, uh, it seems to me that on November 19th, if we're trying to cram all of this in, the alternatives, the uh, looking at the environment, uh, noise, uh, so many issues, I'm sure we want to have a, uh, a long meeting. Uh, I would suggest that we need another meeting, whether it happens before Christmas or after Christmas, to continue the discussion. But I think it's going to be near impossible to uh, deal with all those uh, issues, all of important. And, of course, getting into the uh, issues of alternatives, that becomes very complicated and needs a lot of thought. So I'm uh, suggesting that there needs to be, uh, I think I at least plan a tentative meeting Maybe by uh, some uh, grace of God, we'll get through all of that and everybody's questions the answered and everything's thoroughly covered. But just in case, I think we should have a follow up meeting following the November 19th. Yeah, and, and I, what I was going to sort of say, Bob, is you know, we the thought was we would have our, our November 19th meeting, we'd have all our all alternatives sort of developed, maybe not even, you know talked through, but we'd have a, at least the concepts that we've been considering developed, have the opportunity for the public to look at those, um, provide their comment, and then have another AMPAC meeting following that to sort of say, okay, well, here's, here's the alternatives, here's the feedback that we've gotten from the public, um, how, do, how do we go from here, you know, and, and, and trying to trying to define a, a preferred alternative. I think we had on our latest schedule, both of those things occurring in January, I, you know, I think you're right. I mean, that 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 could be kind of tight. So, um, you know, my concern is because when you're developing the alternatives, it's going to take a lot of scrutiny. And again, I'm not sure if we can cram it all in, even though there'd be a follow up following the, 
uh, comments, but I think before we would even develop alternatives, uh, preferences and configuration possibilities, we would uh, really need to uh, go through all of that before we present it to the public. And I think we want to present to the public, here's where we're at right now, everything's been considered, what do you think? And then we can come back and uh, yeah, take the public comments and then have another meeting go over that. Well, Robert, uh, yeah, Mark, the, I'll, yeah, let's yeah, go ahead. <laughs> sure. No, I, I was going to say let's 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 see what we can learn in November. Let's let's see what's presented to us. I mean, we as the committee have the right and ability to to kind of direct this as we need to. And I, I appreciate your comments, Bob. I kind of want to see what happens, what's presented to us in November. Um, maybe before scheduling too many other meetings and, and defining what those meetings are going to be. I kind of am looking at each agenda and helping to create each agenda um, based on what's really happening on the ground, so to speak. You know, what, what we learn, what we know, what we as a committee want to do. So um, let's, I, I, I agree that there's a likelihood that not, that there will need to be some additional meeting or meetings, um, whether they're in November or January or whenever. I think we as a committee will have to feel that out as we see where we are. But let's uh, let's let's and, and actually this is, this is a perfect segue. Before we leave um, action item number one, uh, is there any you know because we're starting to get into action item number two, which is project schedule and next steps. I would ask, is there any further questions or comments related to the pre presentation and discussion of chapter three um, from the committee? Well, Robert, can I ask a corollary though to what we've just discussed um, since we're on the topic right now? Um, I don't know what the contractual arrangements are, the scope that uh, the city and Mead and Hunt have, but uh, supposing there needs to be more meetings uh, does that mean the council has to approve a budget in order to do that? Possibly. Um, it really comes down to it really comes down to um, what's in scope, what's out of scope, and there is a, a, a predetermined number of times that uh, the consultants from Mead and Hunt have are planning to schedule themselves to meet with with all of us. Um, if if we need more, that there may be there may be modifications required between the city and Mead and Hunt. And okay. Yeah, I don't think we want to leave the report at least one that we'd all agree upon if it wasn't fully discussed, and which may uh, require additional meetings. I hope the council would be agreeable to that. I hope so too. <laughs> Uh, I would hope that uh, there's some optimism prevails in what you're saying. Thank you. Um, and, and again, uh, what I want to do is reach out to the committee members here. Is there anyone who has further questions or comments on item or action item number one, uh, presentation and discussion of chapter three? Hearing none, why don't we move on to uh, item number two, which we've kind of started to go down this path, and I think that's great. Um, let's kind of talk about what what we what what we still want to accomplish. Um, what's what's reasonable for November nineteenth, and what other things do we want to see uh, in the future, if not on the nineteenth, then at some future date. Um, what I have here is it sounds like uh, November 19th will be in an, an overview of, of, of environmental settings at the airport, as well as the uh, alternatives, uh, list of alternatives of, of, you know, based on what we've seen in chapters one through three to date. Uh, is that a pretty re uh, good summary of what we plan to see at November 19th meeting? Greg says yes. This is Greg. Yeah, um, that's that, that's exactly right. I, I think what we'd like to do is try to get the environmental overview turned over, um, and again, that that may come in a in a couple of stages. I think you know the the noise is is, is something that we would typically put in that environmental overview. 
that's probably going to come a little bit later. Um, and yeah, the, the alternatives would be the other other thing we want to talk through. Yeah. Okay. Um, from the committee, questions or thoughts on either what's planned for November 19th or um, possibly future steps. Um, Cynthia, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks, Robert. Sure. Uh, I just have a question for Greg Stern. Uh, this is all about airplanes, and we have a lot of helicopter traffic coming out of C-29, and no, they're not all med flight because saving lives is very important. Uh, is any of this analysis going to take into account the extremely loud nature and varying path of helicopters over all these residential areas? Um, maybe I'll kick that question to Rick. Um, yeah, I, I think we do uh, have some helicopter operations documented. Rick, do you have any thoughts on how helicopters will be accounted for in the noise analysis? Yeah, I'm about to lose my headphone here. The battery's about to run out. But, but that that that's one of the reasons why we said we would look at the, uh, the 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 flight track data that you have is to try to get a at least an idea of the helicopters. Now the problem with helicopters is they don't fly in any pattern whatsoever. They kind of fly where they want to, when they want to, and how they want to. So they are very difficult to incorporate into any kind of noise analysis other than right close to the airport. Um, sometimes they'll take off from the middle of the airport. Sometimes they'll take off on the runway ends. They're just very difficult to deal with. Okay, okay. thank you, Rick. Um, and thank you, Cynthia. Um, from the committee, further comments or questions? Okay. Hearing none, I think we can probably move on to um, our public comment section of the meeting. Um, so we're going to ask that you limit yourself to a three minute time slot. And the first person whose hand I see is Joe Getty. Joe, um, go ahead, you have the floor. First, I'm going to ask if you can hear me this time. We can hear you. Thank you, Joe. Oh, super. Everything is working. It wasn't, believe me, it wasn't at 530. Uh, I am listening to everything that you guys have said and everything everyone has said. But I, I just want to say that I, I deeply resent um, that your committee has headed in the direction where you cut the town of Middleton and the count of Springfield out of the entire program as far as being part of the committee and deciding which direction to go in. I think their input is very important to what needs as to what needs to go on. Um, I think refusing to let them on the committee was entirely wrong. I think they should be on the committee. They represent all of us that live in the townships of Springfield and the towns of Middleton. And we are the ones who are listening to the noise problem. And by taking away that focus from your committee, by not allowing them in and not allowing them to represent us, it's terribly wrong. I also feel that the previous letters that have gone to the committee and to the mayor were extremely important and yet no one responded to them whatsoever that I found. I know that the town of Springfield had a letter published in the newspaper today. I don't know if one is forthcoming from the town of Middleton, but there probably will be. I would like to see those concerns addressed, not just put in the file. And I think that the fact that you people, the city of Middleton 
and the mayor of Middleton choose to completely disregard those statements is wrong. I think a very good word was brought up and that is collaborative. I don't see any collaborative effort. I see you listening to what we're saying and responding to it, but sort of letting it go away. I would like to see more of a collaborative effort. I think it's important to remember safety is a key issue in everything we're doing. The plan to increase the runway by another thousand feet is not safe, especially when you consider the traffic that will be on that runway. I originally thought somehow, some way, aircraft over our area would be limited to something like 300 feet up above us. I find out that that is absolutely not correct. In reality, the FAA can buzz us a new haircut if they want to. And that's to all of us. And if you think it's only as far out as it is right now, guess what? A 5,000 foot runway would bring it even further out to the west and probably further north and south on both entrances to the runway. We need to react, we need to listen to people, we need to do something. This is terrible. And I don't think that the city of Middleton wants a city of Springfield and or a township of Springfield and the township of Middleton to be in an, anta in an antagonistic situation with each other. Those are my personal feelings on where we're going with this. I do like the fact that you're considering safety and I don't have a problem with you improving the operation of the airport, but going beyond and allowing bigger aircraft to land and take off. And one other thing, the fact that you're telling me that an aircraft pilot can decide to take off on one of your runways with a plane that is unsafe based upon what the FAA is saying and use that plane to take off and the only one responsible is the pilot, when the pilot might be killed in a crash landing with what, Sunset Ridge Elementary School? I think we have to really consider the safety of what's going on and the pilots themselves cannot make decisions about what they can and cannot fly out of an airport. It's no different than having a driver's license. You can't take an unsafe car onto the street. Okay, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, Robert, if I could, just for the record, I think Mr. Getty was referring to the airport commission that the town of Middleton and the town of Springfield does not currently have a seat on. Thank that you, Cynthia. Correct. Thank you, Cynthia. That's worth pointing out that actually we have representatives from both the town of Middleton and the town of Springfield on this committee. So, um, um, okay, thank you. Jenny Pavlovic, you have, uh, I see your hand up. Um, you have the floor. So I just have a few comments um, and with a couple questions thrown in about um, considering adding more hangers and possibly paving or and or reorienting the grass runway. Um, I just wanna make sure that the fact that the surrounding communities on at least three sides of the airport have well water is considered when doing any additional paving, construction, any anything going in and out of there and including housing additional aircraft. Um, any fuel spills could affect our, eventually affect our well water. Um, and that shouldn't be an afterthought that's tacked on as a study at the end of all this planning. Um, and I, I have questions about what limitations the solar array and the Highwood Circle residences would put on reorienting or lengthening or moving the grass runway. Um, I know that when the solar array was put in that they, 
everyone was adamant that it wasn't going to be um, in the way <laughs> of either runway, but it's pretty clear that that north south runway is between that neighborhood and the solar array now and there's not a lot of room to change its um direction anyway maybe there's room to move it more towards the north but the solar array is right there and that hasn't been discussed to my knowledge. um and you know i don't know if that could be moved but when the solar array was constructed there was considerable habitat damage done because it wasn't done at the time of the year it was originally planned. And so additional habitat damage could be done in that area if, if that's not taken into consideration. Um, and I guess I just have another question regarding um, considering any changes to that grass runway and whether noise complaints would be considered regarding planes that are using that, especially for training, for touching those that have been circling a lot over the Hickory Woods neighborhood that's like south and a little bit west of the airport. We've been getting a lot of traffic from that runway lately, flying at very low altitudes over our homes. And so I would like that taken into consideration in any, any changes or lengthening of that runway. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it. Um, those were the only two hands I see, but that doesn't mean that there's people who just don't have the uh, ability to um, electronically raise their hand. So I would ask, oh, sorry. Robert, I, want, I just want to say that we received, if I don't want to forget this, we received some comments from, um, that I had provided to the committee earlier at the request of Fred Plansnick and, uh, Doug Knutson and Judy Lyons, just they, they forwarded statements and I forwarded them to AMPAC members. I haven't had a chance to keep up with my email, but a couple more statements have come in, but I wanna emphasize this isn't a public hearing. We will have a public hearing when we document all these concerns. I'm doing the best, we are doing the best we can to forward comments that we get from the public to AMPAC members, but if I receive it during the meeting, I can't promise that we will consider it at the meeting. And Mark, you also you also got town of Middleton analysis from our airport consultant that for tonight's uh, meeting. Oh, I, yeah, I got that at just before, like at three thirty today. Yep. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, haven't even, I haven't even looked at it yet. I haven't. I had a meeting before this one, so I saw it came in myself. But yeah, I haven't. I think I read the first page. Is that's as far as I got before I had to come to this meeting. Um, so that will have to be something I review and probably the other AMPAC members as well review uh, after this well, meeting. We've all gone to the bar and had a drink. Um, is there somebody who would, anybody? Uh, hey, I speak, please. Uh, who is this? This is Robbie Chenis. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Rob I just don't know how to raise my hand on this thing. <laughs> well, that's that's actually what I was asking for, is if somebody wanted to speak up, yeah. and you have. So, Robbie, um, go ahead. How do you spell your last name, Robbie? The last name is spelled K-J-O-N, as in Nancy Alpha Alpha Sierra. Thank you so much. Say, I just have a, a, a comment here. Uh, I live just beyond Bronner Road. And this comment uh, somewhat follows up on something you all had spoken about earlier in regards to the, the transmission lines that, that cut across Airport Road right on Broad Road there and then, and then head north in, in other directions. Uh, I've lived here for 35 years now. Uh, when those transmission lines came up, it was incredible. I mean, just absolutely awesome to watch that event as the helicopters came through and they would hang these people down and uh, uh, erect everything. It was just absolutely amazing. But uh, my neighbor just to Bronner Road, uh, uh, they lost a bit of their property because everything underneath those transmission lines are now for the transmission, okay? So every spring these incredible machines come through and they just grind up the earth. 
I mean, this is like Jurassic Park. They just grind up the earth. There's nothing left there. There's no honeysuckle. There's no nothing. Everything's just all ground up. So they own everything that's underneath there. And I would think that they would own everything above the airspace too. Now, uh, I'm... Uh, cancer stricken so uh i i'm on a death sentence i was given one life to live eight years ago so praise praise god i'm doing quite good uh, but so i'm at home all the time i was outside working yesterday and uh from seven to five it was nonstop airplanes flying over noise makers nonstop over over and over and over and over. As soon as they cross airport road, they head south. Okay, there's a house there and they're just beyond that, there's a house in development. Okay, so they're crossing those transmission lines. Now, some are worse than others. Uh, they're so low that they actually have to elevate to get over those transmission lines. Most are a little bit higher above us, so they just head south and down to go. The transmission line, these air, these uh, helicopters can come through at any time. It's just amazing. Uh, if, if you've ever been around helicopters flying low right over your house, I mean, uh, unlike the noisemakers that fly over, over and over and over and over, this is really incredible, it's awesome. And, 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 and they will go and they'll maintain those transmission lines. They'll be looking at this and that and the other thing. Do you have any idea with what was 50 airplanes flew over my house yesterday? Do they know when those helicopters are coming? Because they're right in their, their flight plan, right in their flight plan. Okay, and they go up and down, up and down. It's not, it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, lateral. They go up and down, up and down, checking out things. Do you know when they're doing that? Sometimes there's two of them, back and forth, back and forth. And you have 50, 50 airplanes flying over those transmission lines daily. And now you're saying there's going to be more. What are the chances? The chances are increasing that you're gonna take out one of those helicopters, take out the transmission lines and everybody living below it. Can you imagine the lawsuits that are gonna come against you and every one of you are gonna be held liable? Every single one of you, not just, not just the mayor, but all of you. So are you, aware of when these helicopters come through. Now, yesterday, there was also a helicopter that happened to come through, I believe it was a med flight, and within one minute, the exact same pattern that the helicopter headed east came right over my house, disturbing all the peace, right over my house, took the exact same trajectory of the helicopter. Did he know that that helicopter was going to be there? Or is this just a matter of chance that one day you're going to cause this extreme habit? Please, please answer. Please feel free to answer. We know the helicopters are there. They make radio transmissions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Robbie. Um, is there any other people wishing to speak for public comment? Uh, yes, this is uh, David Bryce. I'm speaking for um, Dr. Scott Reeder, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, go ahead, um, David. Okay. Uh, first of all, he'd like to thank the uh, committee for allowing him to speak um, and then allowing me to speak on his behalf. Uh, they've been uh, here for over 14 years. They lived in Middleton, and they've actually enjoyed watching private pilots fly through the airspace at that time, but over the past year, there's been an unexplainable deviation from past practices that are recorded in FAA logs and eas easily accessible. It's now routine for dozens, greater than 20 uh, planes, to fly directly over our house on a daily basis, often at altitudes between 500 and 700 feet. 
and sometimes as low as 300 feet, well below the minimum floor. On many occasions, we've also witnessed tandem planes flying less than 100 yards apart, which is a very unsafe practice, especially at these low altitudes. Many of these flights do occur early in the morning and also late into the evening. They don't seem to be respecting the corridors, including the north-south corridor down the ATC power lines to Highway 14, which is just alluded to. At the end, I'd respectively request that the Maury Field Management insist that the flight school and all pilots are made aware of the ordinances for altitude floors over residential areas and schools. Further, further, the unsafe practice of tandem flying in tight proximity over residential neighborhoods should stop immediately. Finally, we bought our house in 2005, fully aware of the commitment of the city of Middleton that's made never to expand the length of the Maury Field runway. Is this promise going to be broken at this time? With the recent situation of innumerable low altitude flights, how are we to believe that an expansion of the airport will be handled in a reasonable manner? Finally, the process of which current proposals have been put forth has been almost entirely opaque, clearly biased by the self-interest of individuals, without any regard for the well-being and property values of longtime residents. This is unacceptable in many levels. To summarize, the appropriate safe practice in airspace surrounding Maury Field needs to be enforced. Consideration for expansion of Maury Field should be paused or stopped altogether. And other things regarding ex airport expansion should be minimized at this time. Thank you very much for consideration of these comments. Who, may I ask, uh, this is Marco, but yeah. may I ask who that was, who you that said you were- That was Scott. Scott Reeder, uh, S-P-O-T-T-R-E-E-D-E-R, -E -E from the town of Middleton in the um, Whispering Winds neighborhood. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, is there uh, any additional people wishing to speak? Um, Mark? Uh, this is Robert, but um, uh, Robert. Hi, um, hi. This is Steve. Steve Ziegler. Great. Go ahead. Correct. Thank you. My first time at this, so I'll be very brief. Uh, the issue here is that alternatives are bringing are being brought forth to the committee, and one more time, the land use compatibility map uh, assessment and things like that has not been addressed. One more time, the environmental impact of expansions and further paving in the wetlands and the Glacial Lake Middleton area have not been addressed. One more time, uh, the general public opinion as to whether the citizens of the city of Middleton the, and the neighboring townships has not been addressed. And to bring alternatives forward for all of these things, the environmental and the social cultural issues to be put on the back burner until after alternatives are on the desk with which, with which need to be whittled away at is inappropriate. And the idea that possible eminent domain of lands for expansion are in the works, which is an ugly thing, both for myself, my neighbors and the city are not in the balance, truly does not give a clear picture of what expansion is going to entail. The key thing here is that 
there has been nobody in this in this uh, situation that has not supported the airport and supported the airport for where it's at, what it's doing, what it's accomplished for the city economically, commercially, and as a recreational facility, although a lot of us take, take the brunt of that. The issue here is expansion. And please take that into account. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay. I think we're going to uh, close down the public comment section. Um, and the last item on our agenda is adjournment. Do I hear a motion uh, from anyone on the committee to adjourn? Richson, motion to adjourn. Thank you, Cynthia. Do I hear a second? Maury second. Maury seconds. Rich, thank you. Uh, we have a first and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you all for your, uh, your, your work tonight. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Robert. Thank you. Yes.